So it is my extraordinary pleasure to welcome um, Sir Nigel Shadbolt here. Uh, I saw him give a talk um, about openness at the British Library just recently, and I thought he'd be a spectacular addition to um, this particular meeting. Um, Nigel's list of accolades is so long that if I really read them out, we'd be here till lunchtime. Um, and I think hopefully he's going to be touching on um, uh, many of the highlights today. Um, with Sir Tim Berners-Lee, he recently founded the Open Data Institute. Um, another big development is with the government data portal where, again, I think with um, Tim Berners-Lee, you were heavily involved in, in founding that initiative. And that's led to a spectacular, really, transformation in the openness of data associated with government and making, uh, giving the public much greater access to that data in a really much more transparent um, way. Um, and uh, that uh, data portal is really the foundation for some of our own activities within the museum associated with the, N the NHM data portal that we'll be hearing about this afternoon. So um, with that, um, it's my pleasure to um, hand over to Nigel Shadbolt. So literally we're just on that. We'll just switch you over. So I think what we will do joys, the joys. Okay, well thank you. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm really going to be talking today, I suppose, it'd be interesting to see to what extent I'm preaching to the choir, but I'm really going to be talking about the point of the open data uh, movement, uh, why it's important, what results we're finding, and really to enjoin all of you here to really take that step to wherever possible imagine uh, releasing your data under open licenses as open data. Now I kind of represent two institutions really, um, the Open Data Institute which uh, we've just uh, opened up literally in the last nine months, uh, has been running since um, October uh, last year and also my day job really is as a professor at the University of Southampton in, in electronics and computer science where I've been working for a number of years on next generation web technology to think of ways in which we could integrate data into the web in a much more natural way. First of all, we just wanted to kind of persuade people that um, this stuff around open crowdsourcing really can be material. And we heard some examples around the, the, the natural history domain. This is one of my favorites. It's quite often used. Uh, it's not brilliantly high resolution here, but to say that uh, when the uh, uh, Haitian earthquake hit in January 2010, there was no map of Haiti of any detail. It didn't exist. Um, and one of the extraordinary things that happened is over a period of 12 days, software, open source software, open standards, and a huge amount of crowdsourcing went in and literally with GPS, with handheld mobiles, with laptops, they were uploading, literally walking the streets of this devastated capital. Um, and within 12 days, they had produced a detailed map of Port-au-Prince, which was essential actually to organizing the humanitarian relief. When you see the video that was put together of that, it's really one of those kind of hair ting, you know, kind of high raising moments on the back of your neck. You think this is, this is a powerful new source of capability. It's not historically new. If we go back to um, Florence Nightingale, for example, the wonderful work she did in cataloging uh, mortality in the Crimean War, came up with some brilliant OFA graphics, by the way. This is the Coxcomb diagram, which represents deaths through, the, through a particular year and, and the observation, crushingly obvious now, was that most people were dying out there through hospital acquired infections, diseases in the battlefield, they weren't dying directly through and on the battlefield. Snow's work on the spread of cholera where again he began to collate mortality statistics, put it on a map and each of these black blocks is a bit of a personal tragedy, it's a, it's a family death and uh, these houses here clearly associating with where people drew their water, this pump here, that pump was locked off. They actually came to a view that cholera was probably waterborne. It hadn't been widely accepted at that point. So the use of data at scale can be transformational, has been in history. And, and it's no less true now. Of course, if we think of a prototypical example, 
the sequencing of the human genome, the fact that that data is available for all to do and research how they will. That's a huge gift to humanity. Um, and not just the fact that that data is available, but that the whole source of open science that arrives from it is incredibly fast moving. So this is um, actually a, a DNA sequence, a piece of the genome of um, E. coli. It was the E. coli outbreak that occurred in, you remember those salad and lettuce in um, Holland and Germany? There was a huge panic. People were getting very, very ill with an acute form of, uh, of, uh, uh, of poisoning. And within days, a group in China had sequenced that particular sample, was spreading the information around the web. People were starting to look and compare against reference models for E. coli and get some idea of what the differences were between this and standard references models to think about treatments. Okay. That is illustrative of both the way in which this data can be put, put to use and the rapidity of putting it to use. And sometimes when you are uh, kind of arguing with people and uh, CEOs and politicians about why do this, you take examples that have been profoundly disruptive and transformational because the underpinning IP, the underpinning data was made freely available, the underpinning standards. In the case of the World Wide Web, this man, Tim Berners-Lee, who I'm privileged to work with, he gave those standards to the world um, via CERN, and they are the fundamental protocols that allow us to build the extraordinary construct that is the World Wide Web on top of existing internet protocols. Or the GPS signal that certainly wasn't developed with commercial applications in mind, but when the decision was taken to switch off the blocking, to switch that on as a commercially available public good, huge amounts of value flowed. And it's inconceivable now um, uh, that uh, uh, that would be switched off, except according, you know, possibly, you know, natural disasters, you know, solar flares, frying the damn stuff. But in, in a real sense, we've come to expect, in just the way we come to expect with the work that was done um, with uh, calculating longitude and working out uh, meridian time, that these things are public goods. Certain data made available has very wide utility. And the story um, that I like to tell, it's not just about the data, that there's this virtuous circle of data for sure, but standards, agreeing formats in which there is no proprietary interest in which to represent the data, agreeing licenses that don't put bizarre restrictions on using the information, uh, a wonderful example of a government that released its data, think it was doing the right thing, and it had one clause in its license that said, do not use this data to bring the government into disrepute. Yeah. What, what, what possible use uh, for most citizen activists is data with that restriction? Um, open source, open participation, the sum total of these elements of open are a form of open innovation that both accelerates and widens impact. So this is why we're excited by this, why I spend my time kind of promoting this, this whole approach. Just to be clear, um, open data is data that is available for anyone to use for any purpose at no cost. And there isn't kind of uh, slightly open. You know, it is either available in these terms with appropriate licensing or not. And just to illustrate um, the, the, the scale of the journey, um, when we began this work back in 2009 under the last government, um, Tim and I uh, came up with a wheeze, which was to imagine um, we would all have the ability to have our local papers give us a little supplement, the postcode paper. This would be a little ab supplement to your local paper, and it would be your postcode. It would be all the public data held about you by government, local government. Everything from your school attainment rates to when the buses ran to where the recycle points were to how frequently the potholes were filled. The whole nine yards. We put this together, actually, uh, at The Guardian. Uh, we assembled a whole range of data, produced this uh, uh, lovely uh, uh, seven, ten-page uh, document, took it along to actually a cabinet meeting, put it on the table, and all the politicians thought the job was done. And then we pointed out that 85% of the content on that newspaper was illegally reproduced. Okay, We had broken Crown copyright. We weren't allowed to use the postcodes because we had to pay for them at that stage from the Ordnance Survey. A whole raft of reasons, some sane, some less sane, about why that data couldn't be reused in an open format. And the 
The change has been remarkable that in 12 weeks we had the beginning of an open uh, uh, data portal, data.gov.uk, which back in the day, um, well, still is, a beta site. One of the things that we kind of took government on a journey was to imagine that the notion of a perpetual beta, a site that is under continuing development, does not expose you to ridicule does not expose you to any more kind of uh, security threats. It's project under work. And the idea that one can always fully specify to the final degree or that you can be perfectly secure and understanding that your requirements have been discharged in these systems is, is illusory largely. So we like to kind of promote this idea of, of agile development, 12 weeks, and, and constant development uh, of products. Within 24 months, we had a site where you actually put your postcode in because uh, the postcode data was now, at this point, freely available. We had about 40% of the Ordnance Survey's core data made freely available at this point, um, which, which was hugely important because the fundamental geography of the country is the connective tissue of a lot of data. And we, we had to have uh, much of that data released. And you can find out uh, various... Um, um, data sets from data.gov.uk. It's had a few makeovers uh, through time, but well over 9,000 data sets there. And these data sets, the meaningfulness of a data set when one of those data sets is the entire geography of the country is, you know, as you can say, is, is, uh, is debatable. Or in fact, that the weather data that's uh, a real-time weather data that's available, the five-day forecast of 5,000 points at three and a half hour predictions out for five days, that's real-time streaming data that is many, many, many files at one level of calculation. So it's, it's actually not the amount, it's whether it matters. And I think the fact it matters is, is also well attested by the fact that just a few weeks ago we had the G8 leaders sign a open data charter, which is a commitment by the G8 countries to release certain core reference data as open data. Um, we'll be interested to see how that goes. And an increasing awareness that data at one level is a piece of national infrastructure. So in the same way that roads and fiber and the power grid a part of your national infrastructure, you need to take particular care of some of the data assets that you're generating and imagine them as available as a public good, whether it's mapping, addressing, transport, education, health, and so on. And mapping those out and working out what should be held for the public good and maintained as a function of government is a really interesting change because in the past, infrastructure has meant cables, machines, servers. It hasn't meant the data. And I think this is a change we need to see in all of our organizations and institutions, whether it's my own university, whether it's uh, museums, whether it's corporates, whether it's government itself, data is going to be a primary asset and some of those assets will be your core infrastructure going forward, even if you haven't collected or, or envisioned it in that way as yet. And the reason it matters is because there is no, no one reason to do open data. There are a variety that helps actually because under different political uh, regimes different of those come to the surface so for some people it's about improving public sector delivery for some it's about growth and economic opportunity for some it's about accountability and transparency actually the great thing is that a government or an organization can take any of those as being illustrative of characteristics of why you would want to do open data the data itself gets better when it's published because typically it isn't complete Typically, the quality is probably not there. It can be improved by publishing it out and getting some eyeballs on it. Research itself is promoted. Social uh, problems around inclusion, poverty, diversity can be revealed. So the overall interesting feature of this is that it promotes a form of good governance. And I'll show a few examples where, where that happens. So this is the case in general for open data. I'll, I will come back to where I think it impacts uh, um, um, your, 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 your business. But you've got to impress and convince the politicians and the owners of the data that this makes a difference. And here's a good example. This is um, a site, um, Public Health England published this site. It's about kind of a slightly scary kind of postcode death rate. Uh, so how long are you likely to live uh, if you're in a particular postcode? What's likely to get you? And actually, you can also partial it out by your socio-demographic group. So the National Statistics Office collects this multiple index of uh, deprivation, which is a kind of a rough categorization of you into a socioeconomic class. 
So, you know, uh, you might be living in quite an affluent area of the country by one set of indices, but still doing quite poorly in terms of some of these uh, particular indicators. All the data here is being driven from the worst Manchester <laughs> to the best um, by open data assets. And for those who are looking at these e-tables, worrying about them, the interesting thing is the conversations you have around them are all around the local reasons for these problems or f issues around funding or issues around provisioning. It's not that people are going to go and die in a ditch because this data is wrong. Uh, they may modify and enhance it in various ways, but this has been an extremely powerful illustration, not least because this has had very high levels of public engagement, um, this kind of data. So it doesn't just sitting, sit there waiting for a few geeks with analytic capacity to come on and look at it. Health is a good one uh, because it partly makes a very dramatic point of the future we're heading for, whether it's, this is Dr. Foster's analysis, again using open data of, of death rates in, in, in hospitals. Uh, this is a really terrifying uh, set of graphs from Lambeth. Lambeth Council publishing a huge amount of its data as open data now. This is childhood obesity by wards in Lambeth and you're seeing a total explosion of childhood obesity from seven onwards. In, in Lambeth, and that will have a material policy impact going forward. The environment has been uh, um, popular, as you might imagine. Again, not all of the data that you would want um, held by various environmental councils and agencies is available as open data. Some of it's sold, some of it's under restrictive licenses. There's a great deal to do here. Some of it is held. Uh, for no very good reason, uh, uh, confidentially by water authorities, for example, utilities. Who, uh, and there is a huge public interest in knowing some of the facts of the matter here, you know, discharge levels in particular parts of, uh, of the UK river system, for example. Uh, this is a nice example put together by the folks at UCL uh, Spatial Analytics. Uh, these uh, lines here are, the density of those lines are Boris bike hires, and the red is levels of lead pollution. And it's just interesting to look at how we kind of funnel all our cyclists into these, well, <laughs> uh, less than um, um, airy parts of town. But it gets people to think about a variety of issues. Could, could they do better in terms of emissions? Could they do better in terms of preferred cycle routes? What could they do? Um, and of course, there's a crowdsourcing element to this starting to emerge all the way from uh, people starting to take an instrument, as we saw earlier in the lightning talks, people building their own instrumentation. Uh, to actually do some of this crowdsource sensing. There's quite a good range of open data that bears on the whole question of governance directly applied to government itself, what's contracted out and what's spent. As taxpayers, we should have an interest in it. And how widely that goes, how far you should be able to look inside an organization and understand what's being spent, who's it being spent on. Um, one that people talk about quite often that we were um, involved with was was opening up the reported crime data um, and it's interesting at one stage the various chief constables were very alarmed that this would lead to a complete collapse in public confidence in the police force you know actually they're now big fans of the publication of data not least because the kind of tools being developed out there give their, uh, uh, their people on the beat better tools than they would have to be able to obtain from their official IT system. So, you know, being able to visualize and see just where the ASBOs and violent crime is in my particular postcode area in the University of Southampton, it tells a rather familiar story, but it tells the story you'd expect. And in some cases, it tells a slightly different one. So these are the reasons why we've seen this dramatic move to a to, to, to an interest in and a supposition that open data might be the way to go. And it led to the establishment of the Open Data Institute in, in Shoreditch here in London. Um, and and we're, we're doing a range of stuff fundamentally to show how this data generates value, not just economic, but environmental and, and social value. We're incubating companies. We have uh, about nine companies currently in residence who are trying to build business models based around open data. Um, assets. We work with uh, groups to uh, show them and, uh, um, uh, both the technical and policy implications of open data work. We have a large membership, growing membership of large corporates who are working with us to see how their data, now this is business data, interestingly 
people don't think that the corporates would have a particular interest in releasing data. We're seeing increasingly organizations who say, look, we would like to expose this data to open innovation because we haven't got the capacity to do anything interesting with it. And we suspect we're just losing an opportunity here. Other companies look at it and say, this is a way of re-engaging trust. You may be, uh, remember that Nike, the sports provider, had a big issue around how it sourced sustainably its, um, you know, its sportswear. It now publishes very detailed open data around its logistics, around how it procures and where it procures. So there are different reasons why, why companies and organizations get into this. And here's a couple of examples of, of the kinds of work that's going on in the ODI, the companies that are being uh, uh, nurtured and incubated. This is Open Corporates, which is a really interesting um, company that is looking to harvest all the information about all the companies in the world. Okay. We have companies house, uh, um, we now have some of that data openly available, which is a start. You would actually like to be able to know all the listed companies in the UK and have that available as open data, which is a URI you can dereference in a web browser and get some information about that company. Imagine if you had it worldwide. Well, one thing you would be able to learn quite quickly is who owns who, beneficial ownership. When we had the economic crisis just a few years ago, one of the huge headaches was nobody knew who was liable for what until they unwound all the ownership. Uh, to be able to do that analysis fast. This is an interesting uh, graphic that was done. This, is, uh, this happens to be Goldman Sachs. This happens to be one company's beneficial uh, ownership map. These are all the subsidiaries it owns. This is its home territory of America. What's this? This is the Cayman Islands. Okay. This is Mauritius, this is Luxembourg. <laughs> you know, and, and, and the issue around there, it begins to reveal really quite interesting uh, uh, questions around uh, where the locus is. That does not look at all the same if I was to select another bank, the Bank of America, for example. Um, this is all available at that website. It quite, takes quite an interesting uh, peruse around that. Another example is a company where we uh, did this uh, work on a very interesting open data set. This is um, in England, all GPs have to publish every month the prescriptions they write out. Not to who, that would not be good, but what drug in what amount. Okay. So that's a lot of data points. You think of all the, all the, all the prescriptions made out. And, and this company actually, uh, we, we, we were working with Brian Goldacre, uh, famous for his work on bad science and, 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 and uh, looking at uh, how we might improve drug trials, a whole variety of issues under Ben's interest. And, and surgeons who, and, and, and clinicians who were interested in understanding how we could put data to use. So what we did was we looked at one class of drug, statins, and we took two years worth of data and looked at one year in particular. And what we were looking at was what the difference would have been had the GPs been prescribing the white label, the generic version of that drug as opposed to the more expensive versions. And we factored out, the, the group doing this factored out issues around side effects and sometimes why you'd want to prefer the more expensive over the less, much less expensive generics. They identified, with all those things taken into account, well, this map for a start, which shows the amount of variation between those who were more or less prescribing uh, at a... Uh, uh, an appropriate level to those who are over-prescribing uh, uh, licensed drugs by up to 35% against their, 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 their peers. We had this down to individual GP level. We didn't produce that uh, uh, map. Um, it's an interesting question as to what we might do. We identified £200 million of savings for one class of drug in one year, potentially, had the generic. Now, that's the analysis. The question about how you do a behavioral intervention, how you use that to do something interesting, is a next stage in all of this work. So the data itself doesn't carry a call to action. It's showing you a situation. The other thing I wanted to just mention is we do recognize that all data ain't open and isn't the same. And it's hugely important here to recognize that there will be data which is restricted, constrained. It may be that it identifies individuals. It may be that it is under pre-existing licensing conditions. It may have prior claims over it. It may exist to a com uh, may, may be the property of a company who's invested heavily in collecting that data together. And the slightly kind of um, salutary point I'd make here is that when people get excited about big data, um, what we have found in the open data world is that the value of open data in this mixed data ecology or ecosystem is that very often quite modest data sets 
are what I think of as the Rosetta Stones for other data. So it's, it's a spreadsheet sitting somewhere that really allows you to make sense of so much more information. And when, when we think about where the data assets live within an organization, and that's an interesting question, it's what we did discover was that huge amounts of the government data estate is not in big databases, it's in fairly scruffily managed and maintained spreadsheets, you know, which may or may not have a stable semantics or may not actually have ever been fully documented. There's always a challenge in working out how we can provide tools and methods to make that whole process much more explicit and manageable. Or, God forbid, the existing PDFs, um, which, of course, is a, a trial and a task to get the data out of those formats. But we live in a world of mixed formats, and we've got to provide methods and tools to, to kind of deal with that. Now, I just wanted to kind of um, close out on a few issues before I talk about your particular context. Um, there are challenges in this world, not least making all this data available. Um, where's it going to be stored? Who's going to store it? What about persistence and management of this? Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting that as we do this, we also find that what was relatively big data just a few years ago is something people can hold on a, a few drives back at home. And so this extraordinary decentralization and distributed nature of what were key archival assets has become a very interesting uh, property of, uh, of, of the data landscape. But there is, in general, a question about who will support the infrastructure. There is an issue around quality. Um, I can give you lots of amusing examples of data that, when it was released, the government thought it was quite good data at the time, was proud to release it. I've used this example many times, but I, I, I'll, I'll use it again. Bus stops in, Eng uh, in the UK, uh, there are 360,000 of them. How many do you think weren't where the government thought they were? The answer is 17,000. Okay, 6% of the data was wrong. Okay, bus stops go missing, they get moved, they get developed, they get closed down. No, no database is a complete reflection of reality at any moment in time. So the real question is how do you deal with the improvement of that data asset? Um, actually, in this case, when the data was released, within weeks, a crowdsourced uh, uh, website had been built where people could put the positions of the missing bus stops in. And that's, that's a huge advantage to any organization to be able to harness that level of, uh, of, 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 of citizen engagement and participation. There's a big issue around data literacy. I think this is possibly one of the most interesting facets here. Um, and again, in talking to colleagues, statisticians, a slight feeling that all this stuff around open data is kind of cheapening the kind of um, business of expert statistics. My argument back is that it's absolutely making heroes of statisticians. It's the new kind of fundamental data science can be one of the new fundamentals of our, of, of our kind of curriculum. That being able to understand how to interpret, manage, incorporate, modify, transform, visualize this increasing set of data assets is going to be hugely important. And there is the never um, to be settled the resolve issue around privacy and security. Doubtless as we release more and more data it's the case that people can use it for ill as well as good. I believe the good largely outweighs the ill but you will see debates. You've seen this really fascinating debate in the last few years around whether certain experiments in avian bird flu should be published in the uh, in, 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 in public uh, uh, peer-reviewed journals because it might give people who wish us harm bioterrorists uh, insights. The real question is what insights do you lose by keeping that information from the open scientific community who are actually trying to think about what we do if something like that happens. So that trade-off, this is my, one of my favorites, this is the real-time position of, of, of ships, uh, AIS, uh, which is great if you're trying to resolve insurance claims and not bad if you're a Somali pirate off the Horn of Africa working out what you want to pay attention to. There are issues around um, um, uh, incumbents that already have a strong data position. There are issues around legislation, copyright. We've mentioned inadvertent copyright restrictions, which actually allow just put huge amounts of friction in information transmission. And, and who knows, perhaps governments will tire of open data. One of the things we're trying to do is, is get so much momentum behind it and show the benefits, it'd be hard to switch this stuff off. And whether you're a cultural heritage institution or a museum or a business, if these data taps get turned off, what you want to hear is a large amount of the demand side saying, where's the supply gone? Okay. 
and I think that's the powerful way to ensure the future for this work. And just to kind of close out, really, um, back in the day when science got organized and uh, the Royal Society launched and the uh, transactions were, were launched, the whole notion was to bring a wider engagement. The whole thing was about exposing correspondence to a much, much broader population. And then, of course, the, the technology was the press. With the web, we're about moving that whole process on. And I think as we look at uh, the world you live in, and I, I describe it as, as, as cultural heritage, you know, as, as the importance of the domain that you inhabit is, is central. You're in a unique position. You have a public task. You clearly have economic value locked into these assets. You have engaging and unique content, and you are authoritative producers. And one of the crucial things about this world is the value in becoming the authoritative issuer of the data labels, of the URIs for specimens, for catalog entries, is really barely appreciated yet. There are a few areas where that's nailed. And again, in, in tax, uh, taxonomic studies, uh, in various parts of library science, this has been understood for a while. But the fact that almost everything you might generate and the reasons you have a classification or a way of organizing your material could have authority by it being issued by this institution as opposed to another. That is a unique both brand and um, functional service to think about. Because at the end of the day, this is all about links, links, links. It's all about trying to provide an environment where we can take not data assets in silos, but to imagine how they can cross-thread, how they can be enriched one with the other. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for a fantastic talk. Um, you've touched on so many issues. I'm sure there are many questions. Um, so opening it up, has anyone got any questions? There are no questions. Charles. No, I've got plenty. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very inspiring talk. Uh, I'd like to come back to this uh, perennial at the moment problem of persistence of data. Yeah. Um, a lot of the data sets being generated uh, in our domain are research grant funded. It's a project which lasts for three years, and then you've got an orphan data set if you're not careful. Um, but I'd like to hear your views on whether you think having silos, uh, world data banks, which exist for some domains, where you contribute your, you, you, you give a copy of your data into that, it's then hopefully curated. Uh, and in my experience, having all your data sets in one pot allows you to do some cross correlation and show gaps and identify errors. Yeah. That model, as opposed to a distributed data set, uh, it doesn't matter if the original source got turned off. Um, images on the web, yeah. once they're out there, yeah. they're all across the web. Um, and then it's just a question of the metadata that allows you to track where they are. And so uh, the, the second, I suppose, part of that question is the value of metadata, your collections descriptions, so that you can take a data set which was produced for a specific purpose, but with appropriate metadata, you can find whether it's fit for purpose to use in other surveys. Well, let me take, I'll take the second part first, because I think you're absolutely right. It is crucial that we do a huge amount more uh, around metadata. And we know, of course, human experience being what it is, that people themselves, uh, except unless you're specialist curators of this stuff, find this really quite difficult and tedious to do. But increasingly, we have the metadata generated at the point of data generation from our instrumentation, from our context, and so on. So that is going to be crucial. Uh, there's a lot more to do around the metadata of issues around things like quality sampling, You know, just, just the stuff around the attributes that give you some sense of, of the context in which it was collected. So I'm with you on that. I think that, in truth, the balance between uh, central depositories and distributed for uh, 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 resources, is, is we need a mixed economy, actually. And there will clearly be one or two cases where there's a lot of benefit in having some highly authoritative, 
integrated resources. I wouldn't like to think of them as silos. I'd hope to think they could be open uh, or accessible, uh, but nevertheless uh, pretty seriously robust and curated as such. Uh, I think there'll be a ca case of that. You can see it in various forms of proteomics work and, and, and that, that those areas. The really interesting question about much longer term forms of persistence and curation, I think that is something we have to get serious about. And it also touches on something that was mentioned earlier, which is what we give esteem for. Uh, the real changes here is going to be when we start to recognize and promote and uh, uh, in some sense uh, acknowledge the value of, of the data management piece. It'll help also in the metadata. At the moment, it's just something you're expected to do along the way. And that's too many cases that's that's the situation so I think we have to if we're serious about data we've got to think about putting the whole in incentivization scheme uh, um, um, in place to support that any more Chris thank you I'm interested in the drivers to make or allow organizations to put data online and put information online. Um, in some cases, bodies uh, have an economic model which requires them to get an economic return for, yeah. for, for the data and information they manage. Sometimes you can, you can help them, if you like, make information more available by the, the whole um, publicity part, by the, the, the um, the showing the value, showing the value of the label, as you, you said at the end. Other times, it's perhaps not in their best interest to make even data available because other people might reuse it and produce a product which will compete with their own. Sure. Um, can you see a way through? Look, there are going to be areas where people believe that um, it's an interesting, really quite deep question in economics. People argue about, you know, does information asymmetry make markets better? You know, markets are meant to work well when people have you know, equivalent amounts of information. Well, actually, most of the time, markets work because I know something you don't. And, uh, and, and that has to be the same for certain sorts of corporate investment as well and IP protection. I, I don't imagine a world in which everybody converts to open innovation as the model to do this thing. What I do I think is a serious conversation to have is around public sector bodies in particular, um, or bodies that are given public sector roles with taxpayers' money, to ask, um, what are they there for? Are we, are we really about making businesses, or are we about providing a public good? And I think we've gotten quite confused about that in some particular parts of the government estate, and I'm on record as saying that. I think, I think that by and large, you have to get, otherwise you get perverse situations in which people who generate this data and are monopoly providers will charge you monopoly rent for it. And they're actually in the public sector, and you think, well, how's this working? So I, I'm, I'd be for keeping that quite clean, but certainly wouldn't uh, rule out that where companies can make a living by having uh, an effort to collect and manage and then sell on data that they have access to and other people don't, why not? The question is how long they will maintain that position. And increasingly in the world, the cost and method of data collection is also showing a very interesting trend to become cheaper in some sense, become easier, and so that you can't necessarily rely on your data monopoly forever and a day. And, and, and what companies are now recognizing is that even if they can, maybe there's a better business model that gives a substantial chunk away to sell the really high value uh, services that they, that they derive from analytics based on that data. Any more? Um, thanks, Vince. Yeah, Adrian Glover, Natural History Museum. Um, fascinating talk. I was just wondering a little bit, thinking philosophically about the differences between data and information yes. and knowledge. Yes. Um, as right. scientists, we the data itself isn't no, I know. interesting. It's Let the it's the information right. and the knowledge. And uh, it, 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 sort of examples here. I think maybe we, we need guidance from you. Obviously, a lot of experience in this. Well, um, where do you draw the boundaries between yeah. for data? You know, is for example. Uh, a very simple example in our institution would be raw molecular sequence yeah, data is yeah, data, yeah. but is the yeah. the classification, the tree of life that, uh, that's made from that, is that also data, or is that something else? Yeah. And how well, can you advise? You're, 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 that? you're exactly right. I'm going to. I mean, look, it, it's a term of art that's come to be snappier, open data. But I, t I spent many years uh, uh, working in AI and, 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 and you know epistemology, where the distinction clearly is fundamental. This is 
information. Everything I talked about was information, actually. I, open data movement, oh, they're actually information sets because there is metadata associated with that that tells you something about the semantics of what it meant. In fact, for me, raw, raw data is literally uninterpreted bits and bytes, and I wouldn't know whether 37 represented your, you know, uh, your, your kind of age or your kind of core body temperature. I, I, that's, that's when you have a piece of uninterpreted data. So it's nearly always information, and then for me, actionable information takes you a little bit towards knowledge. You know, that if I know what I, if I know that this core body temperature means I need to treat you pretty fast with some antibiotics, then I've got a piece of information turned into actionable um, knowledge. But that's very true. And it, it's, you have to be a little bit careful that you don't get just too slipshod about these definitions. And I think they're quite important ones to make out as well. Yeah, I agree. More context. Typically, information gets richer. The more context, the more metadata. I'm Sandy Knapp from the Natural History Museum. I just wonder, thinking about your open innovation sort of agenda, so there's a sort of open innovation, and there's also something which is coming at almost an orthogonal axis, which is responsible innovation, which is another way of looking yep. at how you use how you use knowledge, and how do you see those two things interacting to be sort of open, responsible innovation? That would be interesting. I think this is a very interesting question. I, I think because the open innovation examples we will give you will often feel very responsible because I'll give you an example like you know uh, Jack Andraka, the guy who did the uh, you know five cent cancer uh, paper based cancer detector 15 year old you know reading 8,000 papers and actually trying to work out how to preposterously brilliant insight and uh, this disrupted a whole incumbent technology that's the, that's the kind of open positive side of open innovation but what does responsible research look like and what are the boundaries around that and um, are there self-limiting ordinances you would want to impose? Uh, and that's a really interesting question. I think it's, um, and it was almost, again, it's touched on in these examples, like the, uh, the work research in areas like um, transmissible diseases, the work on, 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 you know, how far do you go with reporting this stuff out, or how far do you go in doing the work at all? Um, so that conversation is kind of beginning to happen, but only early days, I would say. Any more questions? Okay, well, I think we'll um, call it, a, a end it there. Um, if you'd like to join me in thanking Nigel and indeed all our speakers for this morning, and we'll be back in here from two o'clock, where we'll be looking at some of the collections, digitization activities, and infrastructure activities um, associated with that. Just one a logistics message as well. Those people not from the NHM who need lunch arrangements, if they can see um, Ed Baker and Lawrence Livermore, so Ed in the corner, and they can um, help you out with that. So thank you very much, Nigel, and all the speakers this morning. Thanks.